All right, cool. So yeah, once again, welcome to Patch Chat Big Marsh. Like I said, this is a collaborative program between CUS and Chicago Audubon Society. Thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, our focus today is going to be on Big Marsh Park on the southeast side of Chicago, a fantastic birding mecca here. Um, but one of the reasons we picked this is we realized that, you know, while it certainly has quite the reputation, um, you know, not everybody's been there. It can be a little confusing about how to get there. It's such a big site. Where do you even go to get all the really fantastic birds that get reported from this park? Um, and in general, you know, we realized that as we're all still trying our best to, you know, stay socially distant uh, and, you know, recognize that sometimes going on field trips together is not the possibility for everybody. Uh, we want to make it as easy as possible for everyone in the city and beyond to access some of these amazing sites and understand and know how to bird them knowledgeably without necessarily having a guide the entire time. So, Without further ado, we've assembled a fantastic group here of folks who know this park better than, frankly, anyone. Um, so I just want to give a quick shout out here to uh, Stephen Bell, uh, who is the director of Big Marsh and many of the several surrounding uh, Calumet area Chicago Park District Parks. Uh, Walter Martzis, who is a longtime veteran burner of Big Marsh and many, again, of the Calumet area parks and has a wealth of knowledge on the, on the history and current of birds that you can find there, as well as uh, Ben Sarante, uh, Stephanie Bilkey, and Carl Giametti, who are all currently uh, vying for top e-birder at Big Marsh. Uh, it is an ongoing competition, so I certainly said there is no clear victor at the current time, but, you know, they can... Uh, argue that out here however they want. Uh, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our guests here uh, who will talk to you guys about Big Marsh, what's going on there, and how best to get around there. So um, Stephen, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, excellent. So if I share my screen, Edward, do I need to get an invite from you or can I share my screen? My bad, you should be able to get, you should be good now. Okay, let's see. Ah, can everybody see that? Are you seeing my screen yet? Is my screen showing up? Yeah, all right. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background um, on Big Marsh and some of the other sites that are on the southeast side, and then I'll, I'll dive in a little bit deeper to some of the things that are happening right now. Um, which will kind of set the stage for, for the other guests on the panel. So I think that most people are probably, uh, are probably not aware that the southeast side of Chicago features the park district's largest natural sites and that they contain significant habitat that supports an impressive level of, of uh, biodiversity right here in Chicago. Between 2002 and 2011, the park district acquired several parcels of land from the city with the intention of improving ecological health establishing native habitats and opening these spaces to the public as parks. So the six sites that you see on the slide right here, USX and Steelworkers, Marion Burns, Big Marsh and Ridge and Hegwish um, are considered, we call them within the park district, we call them uh, natural areas and function similarly, similarly to public parks, but because um, they don't have amenities like bathrooms or water or field houses, these areas typically operate from dawn to dusk. So there's no light. So it's a it's kind of harsh to go there after dark if you don't know your way around. Um, all of them except USX have parking areas that are associated or adjacent to them. Um, and the park district's vision of Southeast Side Natural Sites, Big Marsh Park with its central location and its infrastructure and the soon to open environmental center is, is envisioned to act as a hub for educational programming for restoration activities across the southeast side. And also, um, some of you may have uh, heard this new term that we've been trying to coin. It's called eco-recreational, or eco-rec. So eco-recreational infrastructure for all of the other sites on the southeast side. At nearly, what, 300 acres, um, Big Marsh is the largest park district natural site in the whole city. The park includes a mix of native wetland, prairie, and savanna, um, as well as 40 acres of bike-focused features that collectively make up the Big Marsh Bike Park. Um, that includes a brand new asphalt pump track. Woohoo! That should be opening in the next couple of uh, weeks. BMX jump lines and several miles of single 
uh, single track trails. I, I'm not really gonna focus on bike related stuff on, uh, at, at, at this time, but uh, I would like to say that it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to go out there and spend a few hours or spend the day, check out the bike, do some hiking, do some uh, birding. And, uh, and we just got a divvy station uh, installed. So if you don't have a bike and you still want to come out and check things out, we've got divvy out there. And at this point, when I left on, on Friday, there were only e-bikes there. So um, you could come out and, and check things out and you could be um, uh, tooling around in style with a little uh, tailwind to push you along on some of those, uh, on some of those trails. Um, uh, this is just, I wanted, I, I feel like people, I, I know a lot of people have been out to Big Marsh, but for the people um, that haven't been, um, been out there, I think it's important to recognize that, um, that today the Chicago Park District and our partners are working to remediate um, and restore and revitalize the site. And that we're doing this by reintroducing native plants, controlling invasive species, removing debris and manipulating water levels in the hopes that Big Marsh and other Southeast sites will once again be, in, be embraced as, as assets for the local community um, in the Calumet region. So these are just some shots that actually came off of my phone from the past, um, except for those muskrats that came off of my phone in the past um, couple of years. And they, they, I think they do a pretty good job of summing up um, what a unique site Big Marsh is. Um, both in terms of the landscape and the opportunities that it affords for people to visit um, and check things out. I do want to go back to this other slide real quick and just point out, here's my pointer here. So Big Marsh, if you're traveling to Big Marsh, um, you can see the little uh, compass rose here in the corner. Um, it is bordered, oops, sorry. It is bordered on the, on the east by the Acme Coke plant, um, on the north by Southern Railroad site on the west by um, both the, um, the golf course and Lake Calumet. And then on the south side down here, um, whoops, sorry, my finger is like super sensitive here on this button. Um, on the south side by the old Paxton, the former Paxton landfill. So all of those, those four sites seem like they're such important and iconic um, landmarks on the southeast side. And Big Marsh is kind of nestled in that little bowl between all four of them. There's Stony, uh, South Stony Ave, Island Ave on, uh, that runs uh, along the west side. And then uh, Torrance is further over on the east. Um, but it's a pretty unique site. And it's a little tricky to get to, as Edward mentioned. But if you um, plug it into your GPS, it should get you there. It's worth noting that if you're coming from the north, if you get off the highway and come uh, go around Doty and then down South Stony, there is a parking lot on the north side with a sign. Usually those gates are locked because we're still doing a lot of remediation on the north side. So typically if it's, if it's your first visit, what I would suggest that you probably do is go ahead down South Stony and get to the south side, the south entrance, and there's a large uh, parking, uh, there's a large parking lot there. Uh, so currently, this is just going from that drone image into um, a little bit more illustra illustrative <clears throat> map. Um, most of the access and activity at Big Marsh is on the, on, on the southern side, the, the, the southern third section of the site. This is the location of the bike park, as well as the Ford Climate Environmental Center. Um, these are the bike park itself is about 40 acres, 40 to 50 acres, um, and it's been capped with several several uh, feet of, of clay. So as we open for this, as we wait for the center to open, um, there is a water fountain here. So if you bring your water bottle, but unfortunately, because it's COVID, water fountains at Chicago Park District um, sites are are not working. So bring water, I guess, is the point there. Um, there are picnic tables. There's porta potties. Um, and there's also a large uh, gravel parking lot. It's not the best gravel parking lot, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's doable. And since this is a pretty small group and you didn't hear it here, but there is a, a parking meter there, but I wouldn't worry about um, paying the parking meter. <laughs> Nobody ever comes to check at this point. Um, so, so don't sweat the parking meter. Um, there are several, where's my uh, 
cursor here. There are several mulch trails that will bring you along the edge of the marsh and take you out to Dearborn Point. And you can also follow those mulch trails down around um, to, Mystery, uh, to Mystery Woods. And they give you pretty good um, spots to look out across the marsh. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen, Mars and the Alkaline Pond are, are for the most part largely unexplored by first time visitors. Um, they look a lot like uh, this, the, the, the landscape there looks a lot like it did when the, the park district first took over the, the site. This side, this whole side of the park, um, I think is probably the section of the park that was most negatively impacted. Um, by the steelmaking industry, and uh, and it's largely covered by slag, which is a byproduct of the steelmaking industry. Um, a lot of times, it was poured out along the railroad tracks, and you can see the railroad tracks run right along here. And when it was poured out in a molten state, um, when it when it cools, it looks a lot like um, cement. And then you'll also see big chunks of um, of slag that look a lot like moon rocks. The northern end of the, the uh, site, Three Fingers Pond and Bessemer's Keep. Stephanie, I put Bessemer's Keep in there for, uh, for you, um, are still in a very uh, active state of restoration. So for the most part, the, we don't see it. We, there is public access out there, but for the most part, people don't go out, don't go out there. Um, we're still hauling in pretty uh, major, uh, significant loads of of clay and soil to cap the north side. So for the most part, it's it's best to stay out of there when the trucks are going um, uh, in and out. The red line on this slide are future trails. So ultimately, hopefully within the next two years, there will be a multi-use trail that will circumnavigate the entire site and will give you access, um, sorry, will give you access across these two sections of open water. So if you're on the south side, you can pretty much stay in, in this section down here. If you're on the north side, you get this northern section. And then ultimately, there's a water crossing here from the main marsh into Three Fingers Pond, and then also from Dearborn Point onto, uh, onto the north side. Um, I included some more drone shots, but I think that those are probably more confusing than they are um, helpful. <laughs> um, I am very happy to say that the Ford Calumet Environmental Center, which was designed by Valerio DeWalt Train, is very, very, very close to opening. <laughs> Even though I've been saying that for the past three years since I was hired to open up the center, but we're, we're like weeks away from opening. Um, the new building is on track to receive LEED Silver certification for its green design and operational features that include the uh, constructed wetland. So the constructed wetland, which is kind of over tucked, tucked in back of the corner of the building here, will handle all of the, the black water and gray, gray water that comes off of the building. Um, the building has classroom and meeting space. There's staff offices. There's real bathrooms, not porta potties. There's staff. There's a staff shower area. And if you happen to be out there and you fell in the marsh and you needed to rinse off, I'd be happy to let you use the shower. Um, there's also a cycle focused outfitter that's on the back, that's um, planned to go into the back side of the center here. And they'll offer things like, um, you know, they'll, they'll carry bike related tools, uh, tubes, tires, equipment, rentals and snacks, that kind of stuff. The center will host uh, school groups, scout groups um, and meetings, which is, uh, it's really intended to act as this gateway to the southeast side and also the larger Calumet uh, region. We also plan to promote eco-recreational activities like hiking and biking um, or hiking and birding and as well as more active activities like biking and paddling and climbing um, and camping and, and uh, fishing. The building will also feature uh, an educational exhibit which is focused on the history, the culture, uh, industry, the history of industry, and uh, the local e uh, ecology. And I think especially for this group, it's important to note that that birds and, and birding really do feature prominently in the building design. 
um, in the exhibit and in the programming. I snipped this slide out of our, our um, exhibit design and it shows some of the features and um, in content um, which focus on, there's a, there's a special section that focuses on secretive marsh birds. Um, we talk about birding as a form of eco-recreation. We talk about that, the impact that restoration has on, on, on bird habitat. And we've been working with the, the Field Museum to um, acquire several taxidermied specimens. There's a, a great blue heron. We've been trying to get a black crown night heron, but I don't think that's gonna work out. A marsh wren, um, possibly a gallinule, and there's a couple other birds. Um, so it's a, a great, it's actually a great location where we can actually talk about birding, um, whether you're a new birder, an old birder, a practice birder, and also um, to use that space for our partner organizations that we've worked very closely with, such as COS and Great Lakes Audubon to host meetings and events. Um, this, is, this is your space as much as it is um, um, our space. And I think that's really, most of what I wanted to show you, this is another little close-up. Um, the section on birds is, is titled A Beautiful Mosaic. And for me, I think that this is really um, what it's all about at Big Marsh. There's so many interesting bits and pieces, and there's so many different user groups that are interested in the site. And hopefully there'll be more in the future, but I'll, I hope you come and check things out. And if the center's open, stop by and um, say hi. And that's me. Although I think you can see me still. Awesome, thank you, Stephen. Uh, it's it's good to know that if anybody uh, is just going way too hard on trying to get their bittern and, and ends up in the marsh, uh, that there is a recourse other than smelling like a swamp monster in their car on their ride home. Um, additionally, yeah, I if if you've ever. Uh, hit up Chicago Ornithological Listings, you know that we go to Big Marsh a lot. We're big fans of that park. Uh, we have several hikes and programs there a year, uh, but it's very, very exciting uh, with the new center opening up just soon, anytime soon, um, to be able to be taking advantage of that um, and continue to just continue to expand our programming down there. So thank you so much, Stephen. Really looking forward to it. Uh, and on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to uh, Walter now. Um, I'm going to pull up his slides here. Uh, and at any time, um, I realize I forgot to do this introduction. If you have questions at any time, feel free to put them in the chat and we will uh, answer them as we go along here. One second. There we go. Okay. Can everybody okay. see uh, my screen and Walter's slides? Yeah, okay. Everybody see um, that? Cool. It's yeah, still in presenter thanks. view. Okay. Thank you, Edward. Um, what, yeah, and Edward, would you, well, actually, I'm such a dunce at this. I can probably, let me see if I can change this myself, but I don't know if I can. No, you better do it, Edward. <laughs> uh, hello, Edward. Hey there. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Just say the word. Yeah. I'll go ahead and switch. I'll just give you the word. Yeah, okay. All right. So it's it's uh it's uh, uh Big Marsh has a, a rich ornithological history, including uh, providing nesting habitat for numerous marsh birds and other wetland birds. Uh, it's uh, uh interesting that uh, uh, when uh, Stephen just showed the iconic. Uh, uh, birds of Calumet slide, uh, the, the word black crown night heron was highlighted and well, what do you know? That's the first one I'm starting with. So uh, yeah, traditionally, uh, historically I should say, um, black crown night herons nested in large numbers at Big Marsh and uh, it, we we're fortunate that there actually were records taken on, on this when it was happening. A, a woman, a biologist named Sue Elston, did uh, black crown night heron nest surveys at um, Big Marsh uh, for both the uh, United States uh, Army Corps and also for the U.S. EPA uh, be every year, basically every year between 1984 and 1993. And uh, generally what they did is they would have about six people, six uh, of her um, 
comrades would walk with her through the marsh and waders, and they would count nests on either side of them. Uh, so they would also take accurate notes on the numbers of eggs and young in the nest or if they were empty. Uh, and uh, the, the number of nests that, um, again, this period, 1984 to 93, most often uh, the, the number of nests ranged uh, uh, around 500 or 600 black crowned night heron, heron nests, uh, but the, the highest count that they had was uh, in 1988, they counted 762 nests. Uh, 71 of those were empty, so so at least the the number of active nests, therefore, was you know closer to uh, uh, 690. Uh, still, uh, just a, a remarkable uh, amount of birds. Uh, 1998 was the last year that black crowned night herons nested at Big Marsh, and the reason, at least the obvious reason, is that because they were flooded out. The the water was drainage was blocked, I presume, by beavers, and the water level was so high that it was basically up to the Stony Island Avenue. It, it was probably six feet higher than it is now when it was it was flirting with the tops of the reeds. The, uh, the uh, night herons would have no part of it and they moved to other nearby wetlands and uh, the rest is history. Um, you can uh, advance please, Edward. Okay. Uh-oh. Look at the black heron night heron nest with eggs. Yeah, I'm not getting it. Are, are, is, is anyone getting it? Can everybody see that image uh, with the this this nest with eggs in it? And your other screen, Edward. It's uh, we're looking at the PowerPoint. It's not. In oh, screen, okay. So All right, hold on. Let me try this again. Okay. All right. Can people see the PowerPoint slideshow? Oh my gosh. Why do I stink at this? Still, still seeing just the power, like the PowerPoint application. Are you doing the the view, uh, the slideshow view? Um, I was. It might be on another screen. I don't know. I apologize, folks. That's okay. One second here. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Can y'all see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. I'm okay. Sorry about cool. that. Yeah. So y'all see it, and that's with eggs in it, correct? Yeah, and it's a bigger cool. picture too. I like big. Okay. So yeah. So uh, I, this is. I did have an opportunity to actually walk into the marsh in, uh, in 1991 with waders, of course, and I did take some pictures. So here's a here is a. Um, in the flesh, a black crane night heron nest with eggs. And you can move up to the next slide, please, if you can. Yeah, and here's the babies. Okay, same day. Uh, uh, so uh, I will just tie this part up about the black crane night herons with just to mention that uh, while Sue Elston was doing these night heron surveys, they also documented nests they found of other marsh birds including pied-billed grebe, common gallinio, coots, marsh wrens, and yellow-headed blackbirds. Let's move to the next slide. So, uh, yellow-headed blackbirds. So I mentioned that they nested there in, in the 80s and, and the early 1990s. Uh, and uh, they were a feature throughout the Calumet region at that time. And they, uh, they basically were gone from Big Marsh by the end of uh, the 90s. And um, there are many reasons for this, but that is a, a, will be the subject, I'm sure, of a, another program that's a little involved. Um, they, eventually, they, they departed the uh, Calumet area, the Illinois Calumet area completely. And the last territorial male was at the Eggers. Grove Forest Preserve in 2013, and since then they have not uh, come back. Uh, can we advance? Just to put in context, I'm happy to be able to show some photographs from the late Alfred Royce. This was this photo was taken at uh, Calumet Cinder Flats in September 58, 1958, and uh, Calumet Cinder Flats is basically the current site of 
of Harborside Golf Course. So it is um, basically across Stony Island from Big Marsh. And it's this this group of yellow-headed blackbirds, it's certainly reasonable to say that some of them may have come from Big Marsh, uh, the nesting area there. Uh, so, so again, there were the, the, historically, Big Marsh has been a great area for uh, for uh, nesting marsh birds, and we are trying our best to manage it for nesting marsh birds as well. We would love to bring yellow-headed blackbirds some back someday. Not happening yet. It's difficult. The other bird I have to mention is black tern, which nested throughout the Calumet River and certainly nested at Big Marsh. Uh, gone now, just basically gone. Um, and uh, last nesting at Big Marsh was, was 1986. Again, rich ornithological history. We have been able to keep some of the other species through management like common gallinule, pie-billed green, well, uh, marsh wren, uh, least bitter. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not a lost cause. We're doing better all the time, and hopefully we will we'll bring back some of these birds. We can uh, advance. Um, Big Marsh has historically been a place also where rarities and vagrants had been found. Uh, one to two tricolored herons summered at Big Marsh most years throughout the 1980s. Uh, most years I only saw one, um, but I was lucky enough in uh, August 1989, I actually did flush two together. Really awesome. Um, by the 1990s, uh, the tricolors stopped visiting Big Marsh, and uh, I think this is, you can kind of see, this is a trend that was developing that uh, when you, the earlier years, 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of interesting birds uh, uh, um, were in the area, and they started to taper off, and, and of course, uh, the uh, logical reason for that was, was the fact that the quality of the marsh was uh, declining, um, becoming very degraded, especially with invasive species like Phragmites, reeds, carp, etc. So, moving along to the next. Yeah, the, the tricolor herons stopped visiting in the 90s, but the 90s brought another rarity. Um, in, <clears throat> on August 14, 1993, Sue Frisha found a reddish egret at uh, Lake Calumet, and this was the uh, first confirmed state record. Uh, it turned out that during, um, it stayed till at least October 2nd, and throughout much of, <clears throat> of um, September, it was often found at Big Marsh, and really exciting bird, and haven't seen any of them there for a while. Uh, you can advance. Um, this is another one of, um, of uh, late Alfred Royce's slides. Uh, this again is the Calumet Cinder Flats. I don't have a lot of uh, historical um, photos from Big Marsh, but this again is 1961, and this is the type of scene that you would expect to see at the Cinder Flats migra migratory shorebirds. Uh, in this shot, there's 43 uh, ready turnstones together, and I, well, last time I saw a group of ready turnstones this large was probably in 1968, something like that. Uh, you don't get them, and you certainly don't get them at Calumet in those kind of numbers anymore. But, but the the point I'm trying to make is that historically and and in recent years as well, as long as appropriate conditions are present, by which I mean very low water levels, Big Marsh can be a magnet for shorebirds. Um, in recent, uh, the recent decade, the water level has been very high, so we have not seen a lot of shorebird habitat. But in the first decade of the 21st century, there were, there were several drought years, and we had a lot of really good shorebird habitat. Uh, going by the current eBird database, 31 shorebird species have been recorded at Big Marsh. So gives you an idea. Uh, next slide will be my final slide. This is uh, just evidence that when conditions are right, it still attracts shorebirds. Uh, this my date in dating is off. It should be 2 May 2018. A drawdown was conducted, uh, and uh, during May, early May of, uh, of 2018, uh, lots of shorebirds showed up of many varieties. But this is just a, an illustration of that uh, big flock of American golden plovers. And so, yes. Uh, 
Uh, I think you know the, the the reason it's it's difficult to get any kind of low water in the area is because the drainage is into Lake Michigan, and Lake Michigan is at one of the highest levels in in uh, almost the all time high level. So once Lake Michigan comes down, we can uh, lower level in some of these areas hopefully, and see lots and lots of shorebirds. And um, I'm gonna stop right there. Awesome, thank you, uh, Walter. Uh, we have a couple of questions in here regarding uh, the yellow-headed blackbirds and in particular why they left. I don't know if Stephen or Walter, if you can kind of speak to that at all. Well, I sure can. <laughs> uh, the, the, in a nutshell, okay, one of the one of the problems that happens in a lot of the wetlands, and again, I don't want to drag this out, but uh, but the, the type of habitat conditions that yellow-headed blackbirds really require, it's called hemi marsh. It's a type of marshland which is is one half approximately one half open water and one half emergent vegetation with a lot of interspersion and a lot of edge habitat, and when things like drought happen or flood uh, the condi and plus the invasive species entering the area, all of this degenerates the area and ruins the capacity of it to create, create a hemi marsh. Uh, you often end up either with a monoculture uh, without openings or you end up with an open lake uh, without a lot of vegetation and none of this is appropriate for yellow-headed blackbirds and many of the marsh birds. And what happened is over a series of decades, we had multiple instances of this and just the hemi marsh habitat was basically lost. And um, the, the uh, yellow-headed blackbirds responded by just simply, they just, you know, they, they couldn't hang on to it. They just stopped nesting. And, uh, you know, again, I think that there is uh, hope if, you know, right now we are managing for hemi marsh and, uh, and that, uh, that could bring them back, back conceivably. Uh, we're at the edge of the range, uh, so it won't be an easy thing, but it is certainly a possibility. I hope that answers it. Um, yeah, and also in the same question, again, if I can, either you guys can speak to that, uh, the ongoing work of the park, uh, habitat restoration or environmental remediation or both? Yeah, I would say that it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of both in terms of remediation. I think the, 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 the technique that we've been using at Big Marsh is to actually go in and, and cap the areas that are highly polluted that still have toxins in them um wh where when that's called for so that's usually that's been the first step and then on top of that cap we're working on restoration so i think that there's i mean we're doing some shoreline restoration we're definitely working on the savanna we're working on the prairie so it's a it's a it's a com it's a combination i guess is the short answer awesome uh, was the reddish egret a one-time occurrence? Well, it was a one-time occurrence, but it, but the bird stayed for uh, basically, uh, well, month and a half, I guess. Yeah. And you know, you know, again, uh, I can't emphasize too much how how important uh, lowering water levels is for some of these these uh, wetland bird species. Uh, uh, and the reason I mentioned that in regard to reddish egret is because what attracted that uh, that bird was the fact that this is when Harborside Golf Course was being constructed. And the way that they were constructing it was by dredging clay off the bottom of Lake Calumet and then depositing it to cap off the hills of Harborside Golf Course. The way that they were able to access the clay at Lake Calumet was by doing a complete drawdown. So you had like uh, just very shallow water for the whole south and the end of, of uh, Lake Calumet and that brought in, you know, not only reddish egret but but plenty of, you know, great egrets and, and other herons and uh, shorebirds as well. I, my, my high count all time of uh, semi-palmated sandpipers was that month at Lake Calumet as well. It was, you know, over close to 300 and uh, uh, so yeah you know that's a uh, that's again this is management it, it was inadvertently they were managing for birds they were really just trying to collect scrape mud off the bottom and clay off the bottom but boy what a boon for the birds and so so yeah I mean again you know management is it's such a huge part of all this and, and you have to think in those terms awesome 
Uh, I know we have some other questions here, but we'll get to those. I'm going to piss, uh, pass it over to uh, Ben, who uh, has got some fantastic visuals to share with us here about some current day burning. Okay, hi everybody. So just to preface, I am not an expert at all, but it, uh, Big Marsh is a place that I really enjoy quite a bit. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm going to be sharing, just uh, a little bit of what I've seen. And then, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to share this. Um, maybe some recommendations on some good routes to take if you're planning on visiting or routes I like taking. Okay, there we go. So can everyone see my screens now or my screen? Okay, cool. Um, so I uh, just took that, ooh, there we go. So I just took that same um, map that we were looking at before and I kind of just pointed out a couple hot spots where I like to stop and look. Um, and again, most of them are on the south side. The north side, I, I do um, mostly along the road, uh, check a lot for rafters during different times of the year, winter. That can be a really good place to see them. Um, and some of the habitat um, here can be good for sparrows, uh, snipe, some other things uh, like that. But again, I, I don't really hike too much in this area yet, but I'm really looking forward to that in the future. Um, so what I kind of, so what I normally do is kind of scan as I'm driving in get a sense of what's on the water. And then I usually park um, in this uh, southern lot down here. Um, and the first thing I do is scan actually the, the tree line along the parking lot. And this tree line right here, especially during migration, it can be a great place to see warblers. Um, the, I, just the edge habitat is, uh, seems to be a good way just to get visuals on things that are a little tougher sometimes. Um, and so the way I broke this down was just kind of like spring, summer. Um, and a lot of these spring birds would also apply in fall migration too. Um, but again, higher water levels. So I think last April, there were a group of pelicans that hung around for a few weeks. Um, they were really fun to watch. Um, typical warblers for the area um, uh, are usually around. And again, I think the, both of these pictures were uh, along this fence line or the fence line in the parking lot actually. Um, in terms of the, the then marsh birds like the rails and soras, um, for those and for the pelicans really walking along this um, path along the water, um, that path has pretty great views of the marsh. Um, a scope is really helpful for that, but most of the time I'm just using binoculars to spot things out there and you can still see quite a bit. Um, and especially right along the edges here, that can be, depending on the day, a great place to get a closer look at some of the secretive birds like Sora or Virginia rails. Um, you know, every time is different, but it's uh, one of the most reliable places I've ever found to, to, to look and see those birds. Um, and then that's it. Uh, Another great spot is, so there's like the concrete um, kind of slab area um, right at this number three. And that um, that's another great place to stop for a while, sit down, um, kind of scope things out with the binoculars. Um, and along here, I should mention two, uh, two and three, um, least bittern is also possible or possible here, depending on the day um, over the summer, for sure. Um, and then winter, again, that higher water level. So since I've been birding there, um, because the water level has been higher, there've been a lot of, so waterfowl is typically what I find in the winter. So again, all pintail. Um, last winter, the tundra swans, I think all three swans were there at one point for a few days um, in a row. And then we have cardinals, tree sparrow, things like that. Um, and then, sorry, I keep blocking my own controls here. And then the other thing I'm, I always look for, um, really all the time, it's, it's been a great place to see uh, eagles, hawks, and falcons for me. So peregrine, um, I don't have pictures of kestrels here, but they're often 
um, there and in the, the, the eastern area, especially behind the Mystery Woods. Um, that area, I don't typically see too many people back there. And some of those open spaces back there can be great for Cooper's Hawk, um, Harrier um, too. And then of course the bald eagles um, and rough-legged hawks too uh, at the right time of year. So, oops, sorry, back on this map. So this is that back area I was talking about. If you keep going along the trail, you can kind of walk along um, this back trail, um, still staying on this Southern, so like the Southeastern side. And that's um, pretty underverted, I would say. Like I don't see a lot of people going back there um, when I'm there. Uh, and then last thing, I, I really love that, of course, I usually focus on birds, but there's so much else to see too. Um, so beaver and muskrat, um, uh, muskrat especially, like have I've really enjoyed watching them at Big Marsh. Uh, they're in that same area along like two and three where, um, where the rails and uh, sori typically look for. So decays brown snake and then uh, deer, even in that degraded habitat in back, like a little bit, um, I see there, them there quite a bit as well so yeah that uh, it's a place i really love and i enjoy exploring it um every time i go i see something new i feel like uh so yeah that's uh all i have and again i'm not by no means an expert so just wanted to share some of my experiences there yeah definitely a lot of fantastic spots that are it's, once you go get off just to the main trails, even by the center, there's a lot of fantastic birding still to be done. And uh, I was was it I want to say it was maybe two three years ago where there was just that rush of uh, rough legged hawks, where there was like twelve of them all hanging out there by the landfill in Big Marsh. Incredible year. All right. Yeah, I was, so, I was looking. That was 2016. Um, okay. I, I was actually looking at that, and yeah, I think the high count was 16 or 17. Uh, rough-legged hawks and uh, you know they would just perch out you know on power line and top of power poles and everyone I was looking for a photo here I could uh, I could share and give me one second here just to give people a uh, an idea as to how uh... there we go just to how, how cooperative these rough-legged hawks were uh, oh, sorry that was that was yeah end of 2016 2017 and and really they were they were focused on the landfill just to the south here because um, you know that, that's a great place when you are at Big Marsh uh, especially later in the day when you start to get some heat and air uh, air rising uh, you'll get raptors just soaring uh, and hovering over the uh, landfills there and uh, and you'll get uh, yeah like I said just rough-legged hawks uh, uh, occasionally in the winter you don't uh, don't usually get that kind of number, but that's a great place at any time of year to always scan for raptors. Um, uh, I think yesterday we had uh, red tails and kestrels over there um, and stuff. So yeah, that's a great place to look. Uh, and then in the winter time, when you get to February and March, a uh, great place to look for uh, gulls as well. Um, it gets a little distant uh, to pick out the good gulls, but uh, still the numbers there, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gulls. Yeah, and I think that's a fantastic kind of emphasis point too on the fact that, I mean, this is definitely a year round birding destination. I mean, there I don't think there's any point that's not a good time to be there to look at, be looking for something. It's fantastic pretty much every time of the year. Uh, Stephanie, do you, have, um, I, do you have a presentation or some photos to share with us? I do, yeah. Awesome. So I'm, I'm next. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, um, one minute, share. All right, can you see my slide? Yes, okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about our, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the Calumet Marsh Bird Survey and our maps for banding station at Big Marsh. So I've got two different hats that I'm wearing, my Audubon Great Lakes hat and COS. So I'm the conservation science manager at Audubon Great Lakes. 
And part of my job there is overseeing a Calumet marsh bird survey that includes big marsh. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my route there. And oh, first I wanna mention my first ever visit to big marsh was in 2016. And it was just kind of by accident that I ended up there in March of 2016 heard about a work day and showed up and when I first got there I just felt like I wasn't supposed to be there it just looked so odd and the park hadn't officially opened there were no signs or anything so I I, I had a great time though and I had no idea that I'd be spending so much time there uh, so So first I'm going to talk about the Calumet Marsh Bird Survey. And so this is just a picture uh, at, right at, at dawn, basically at sunrise, at, um, at one of my marsh bird survey points at Big Marsh. So that's our, that's our view there. And there's a, there's a photo of a common gallinule uh, with food in its beak, uh, carrying food for its young. But basically for our Calumet Marsh Bird Survey, we set up a series of points across a wetland and we have multiple wetlands that we're, we're surveying in order to see how marsh birds are responding to restoration and management. And so this is just an overview of where my survey points are and we visit these points three times in the spring and we conduct a, a playback for a secretive uh, birds, and then we also keep track of all uh, 17 different uh, species that we're, we're focusing on. So there's another, another photo from my, one of my points. I think that's probably point number four. This viewpoint right here is, is right around here, looking out. So these are the 17 marsh bird species that we focus on. And so um, there's, there's a few on here that you know, we, we don't typically get as many of, but uh, several others are, are pretty common. The ones that we've never had on a marsh bird survey include, uh, I think the only one that we've never had on a survey is black tern. Um, yellow crowned night herring and king rail snowy egret are pretty rare, especially because um, their range is, is typically, and little blue heron, uh, their range is a little bit further south. Um, yellow headed blackbird and American bittern, we also get very few of those, but the other ones are, are fairly common at our sites. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do with uh, these surveys is tracking progress over time. And so we actually started surveying at, in 2015 at Big Marsh and uh, the bar graph is showing the number of species that we counted uh, from 2015 to 2020. And then the, the map is showing the, the difference in um, the amount of vegetation and the change in water level after the Chicago Park District did a, a huge uh, restoration effort where they lowered the water level and burned uh, Phragmites, and, um, which is an invasive uh, species of grass. And after, after they did that, um, uh, we got kind of a flush of new growth of a lot of cattail. Some of the Phragmites, is, a lot of the Phragmites is still there but you can really see the difference between 2015 and 2017, how, how much more habitat is available. And they're continuing to um, restore the site. It's, it's kind of a never ending battle against the invasive species. But um, so far we've seen incredible rebound of, of birds that have come back. So in 2015 and 2016, you can see we maxed out at two species. I believe it was black crown, heron, black crown night heron and marsh wren and then um, after they did the herbicide and burn and the water levels were lowered. Uh, in uh, 2017, we jumped up to eight species, maxed out at 11. And uh, last two years, uh, we had nine species of marsh birds. And these are our common breeders at the bottom, common gallon mule, swamp sparrow, Virginia rail, Sora, marsh wren, and least bittern. Uh, this year I saw Sora with a couple of chicks following it. Um, and then least bitterns, we were hearing all over the marsh, uh, kind of in this area and also had some down here. And um, they, they were very noisy over the summer, which leads me to believe that they likely had chicks as well. 
All right, so that's that's my my quick overview of the the marsh bird monitoring. I definitely have a longer spiel that I could go into, but that'll that'll be saved for another another talk. So I'm going to jump right into our marsh or sorry, not marsh birds, uh, our bird banding station that we started this year. Um, looking at Stephen's map, I probably should have called this Maps on Mars because um, Maps is the name of the protocol. It's called it's uh, an acronym for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship, which is the protocol that we use when banding birds. And pretty much all of our, our nets that we use for, for catching birds are on the, the part of the, the park that's kind of known as Mars because it's um, where a, a lot of slag dumping activity took place. And you can see that it has this kind of reddish color. Uh, there's there's a lot of shrubby cover in this area as well. Um, we found out when we were setting up our nets that it was pretty hard to, to put stakes in the ground uh, because, because of the slag um, made, it, made it pretty tough to, to pound things into the ground. But um, basically uh, for the process of uh, banding, we put up mist nets. So this is, a, this is not at Big Marsh, but this is a, a better picture that I had of what a mist net looks like. Basically, it's this fine mesh uh, that you, you string across between two poles and uh, the birds don't really see it because it's fairly fine. Um, and then they, they fly in and then uh, when they hit the net, uh, it, it has this little pocket here so that they kind of drop down into a pocket. The net stretches out so that it kind of like catches them and it, it's not, you know, super taut. But then they, they fall into a little pocket, we go and check our mist nets um, uh, every half hour to see if any birds are in them. And we do this for the MAPS protocol. We're doing it once uh, about every 10 days or so just during the summer. And what we're doing is we're keeping an eye on what birds are breeding at the site. Um, so it's a special protocol that uh, looks at uh, you know what what birds are present how what age are they what 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 is the sex uh, we take a lot of detailed notes looking at molt as well and that that can give us some some ideas of you know what what stage uh, of development or, or what stage of molt or what age the bird is potentially so you can see with this robin here it's got some feathers growing in um, so it's replacing uh, its wing feathers. This one, these ones over here look really ratty. So it's, it's about to replace these as well. So when birds are molting, they tend to, or songbirds tend to replace the inner feathers first and then they work their way this way and this way. And these are the, the primaries and the secondaries. And you can see all the, the data that we're collecting on the, on the sheet there. And all of this information helps us understand, you know, how productive birds are, you know, how many young they're producing. We, if we catch young birds that were born this year on site, we can, we can get some information on that. And then we can also, since we band year after year, we can learn a little bit more about how, how long these birds live. And, you know, it might be different site to site. And since we're part of this larger protocol, there's people doing this type of um, banding, uh, across the, the continent. And so we can compare our data to somewhere else. And this is a really unique site where we're on a, you know, in part of an industrial uh, landscape. Uh, so we, we really can find out more about, you know, if these birds are inhabiting this, this area where there's a lot of slag and past contamination, you know, how long are they living? Are they thriving? Are they doing well um, compared to other sites? So um, just doing a quick uh, picture time. Uh, so these are some of the birds that we banded this year. Uh, yellow warbler was uh, our second most common uh, species that we caught. This is a female shown here. We've got a lot of indigo buntings. Um, and this one was molting, as you can see, it's uh, getting more of the, the blue feathers in, it's a, a, a male. Uh, and American red star, we did not, we only caught one, so we think that they breed on site, but it could also be an early migrant. Uh, Baltimore Oriole was only a single bird that we caught, but definitely worth a photo op. 
And then uh, common yellowthroat, Songsboro, blue gray gnatcatcher, eastern kingbird. And here's, here's our totals that we caught over the summer. Uh, gray catbird was the winner with 44 individuals that we caught. Um, of course, after we, we, when we catch them, we um, put a band on their leg with an individual number. So if we ever catch it again, uh, we know where it came from. And then we have all the, the details and notes on uh, what we determined for the age and sex originally. So hopefully we'll go back next year and, and catch some of these guys again because they'll return to their, their um, breeding grounds where they, they nested this year. So in total, we um, banded 200 individuals of uh, 20 species. And just want to shout out to our, our banding crew, Anastasia Rowland and Libby Keys helped me out this year. We operated kind of in a unique way due to COVID. So we all had kind of three, two to three nets that we operated separately so that we you know, weren't, weren't touching all the same equipment at the same time, so. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, check out our website, Audubon Great Lakes, uh, gl.audubon.org, and shoot me an email if you want to learn more about our March Bird Monitoring Program. And then uh, Chicago Orthological Society has uh, more information on our banding station, will be posted on the blog. Um, if you want to learn more about what MAPS is, the Monitoring Aving Productivity uh, Protocol, just go over to birdpop.org. So that's that's all I have. Thanks, Stephanie. And this is uh, this is a basically your your reminder here that if you go to Big Marsh, you will definitely get cat birds. So if you're looking at for a year bird, uh, you will definitely get cat birds at Big Marsh. So great reason to come on down. Um, and just in general, thank you, Stephanie, also for uh, you know pulling this banding station off in well, the middle of a pandemic. It was very unclear whether it was even gonna happen or not. Um, so it was really exciting to finally see that all come together. Uh, so at this point, uh, if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and slap them in the chat there and see if we can answer them. Um, I know one of the questions we got here, uh, I'll ask, because it was sent to me privately an accident. Has anybody got any owls there before? So uh, here, I'm going to go ahead, because I know you, Edward, you were holding uh, owl prowls uh, there, uh, weren't you, trying to... Well, you know, I am something of an owl aficionado. I do lead them around town, but I've never gone to Big Marsh for owl hikes before. I don't know what the situation there is. So uh, hopefully you can see uh, my screen here. And back when the restoration work was going on, and uh, uh, Stephen, uh, cover your ears here, I used to sneak to, onto some of the areas of the park that were not necessarily open to the public just because one of my kind of favorite places, I like to go birding in places that not a lot of people are going. So I'd sneak around to the kind of the north side of the park here, um, really before they did a lot of Phragmites uh, clearing. And uh, you know, if you talk to Stephen or like Laura Umek, who was a project manager uh, with the park district, did a lot of restoration work here. This particular area here, they've done a lot of clearing of uh, um, low quality trees and stuff, but it used to be fairly heavily wooded. And uh, I came around to this side and I'd have to find the day, but it was in uh, April, I believe. And there were two great horned owls uh, in these trees here. Uh, I went back uh, a few weeks later, was not able to relocate them. So I don't know if they actually tried to breed in this area. Um, great horned owls obviously breed in a variety of places, but those are the only owls I think I've ever had in Big Marsh. I don't know if Walter, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Walter's had a snowy owl here or something like that sometime, but, uh, that's, uh, uh, Carl, no such luck, but no, I, I, I hear you on great horned owl because, uh, uh, there definitely was a, a great horned owl on a nest. And again, I, I did research a bit in the nineties, I think. Uh, and it was again in, uh, the, the cottonwoods at the North end of, uh, off Stony Island, which of course no longer exists. So, and again, this is part of uh, the restoration that is being done, and it's understandable. And they're they're aiming for a savanna type habitat, and that's fine. But uh, you know, uh, uh, great horned owls will exploit suitable habitat if and when they find it, and there there is a lot of that type of habitat elsewhere in the Calumet region, Hegwish Marsh and uh, uh, other areas and some Bobian Woods. So, so they, they nest sporadically throughout the area, but they have, and Lake Calumet also, 
but they have nested at uh, at Big Marsh and um, probably not enough trees at this time, but who knows what the future will bring. So no uh, short-eared owls on Mars. Mm, Darn. Nah. Edward, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to hijack the screen just one more time because I want to share, I'll share this link in the chat here. But for those folks that are interested in a really detailed uh, history of, and I don't know, Walter, uh, if you can see my screen, but there's an update yeah. to this document. But um, yeah, there's, yeah, there's you know, no updates uh, really. But uh, the big, basically, basically, Stephanie and I are creating the updates as we go along, I guess, because we're trying to uh, uh, bring back all these, you know, um, endangered and marsh birds. Yeah. So, so this this document here that I threw in the chat is a really fascinating uh, document, you know, written by two giants of Chicago area bird conservation and Judy Pollock and our very own Walter Marzich there. So. If you want to kind of get a really detailed history on the uh, uh, breeding birds uh, uh, of the Calumet area, it really is a fascinating read. Yeah, for sure. I got a couple questions directed at you, Stephanie. Specifically, uh, how do you gauge the age of a bird, and what was that sparrow you were holding? Oh yeah, that's a that's a fun one. <laughs> I could go into so much more detail if we had more time. Um, on aging. Uh, so actually I have a book right here. I don't know why, well, I, I was using it. So I just, you know, just having to keep it right next to me. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole uh, guidebook basically to how to age birds. And this is only, this is only songbirds in North America. So it's, it's pretty thick. And um, basically what we look for is molt. And so young birds tend to grow their feathers really quickly and they wear out more quickly than an adult bird um, because they're growing them all at once. They have to put all their energy into growing all those feathers. And so you can look to see the quality of the feather and if it's a, a, a feather that's really worn next to a feather that's grown in more recently, that, that can tell us um, something about, you know, that that bird is retaining its juvenile feathers and it's getting uh, new feathers that are look like an adult, you know, a higher quality feather in next to it, then that bird was likely born last year, something like that. But it all depends on what time of year and um, being able to, uh, you know, figure out, you know, in the, all the birds start molting in the summer. So in the fall, all the bir birds that kind of look like they were born last year are actually birds that were born this year. And then, so we can only tell, you know, we when we age it it's like we can know if it was born this year or if it was born last year but we we have it's it gets a little more complicated aging it more than more than that but with banding of course if you catch a bird number of years in a row um like a, a bird uh that i banded at horicon marsh during a banding demo we aged it as an after second year meaning it was born at least two years ago and then it was caught um, about five years later, so we know it was at least seven years old. So that's that's another <laughs> that's another way. Nice. Um, well, oh, in yeah. the yeah the the bird at the the last slide, I forgot to put a caption in there. That was a juvenile field sparrow. So that was that was cool to see. We've been hearing field sparrows singing all all summer, but we we don't know if they're breeding unless we actually see the the juveniles there. Um, so it had all that that streaking on it kind of a, a goofy looking, got its baby plumage on. So yeah, that's, that's that. Nice. Yeah. Here, here's hoping we can go long enough where we can start finding, you know, birds that are returning year after year, seven-year-old field sparrows, maybe. Fingers crossed, right? I don't know if they live that long. <laughs> but yeah. Maybe. Got a question here. Uh, is Calumet Harbor still actively receiving cargo ships? I know the general answer, but I don't know if anybody, any of our experts here have a more specific answer. Did you say Cargill? Is that what yes, you're asking? Correct. I, I know where Cargill is. It's 117th and Torrance. Uh, I don't know, but I would assume so, but, uh, but I don't know for a fact. Yeah, I, I know the Illinois Port Authority, you know, you hear every couple of years in the news, there's an article that it's bankrupt again. So I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know to what extent it's, it's really operating. Um, you know, there's the, the one large uh, cargo ship there that's seemingly permanently docked and rusting away uh, there. But uh, I, I, 
don't see too many barges going by. Uh, uh, on the, I, I think maybe I have like in the Little Calumet River, um, closer to like Hedgewish Marsh. Um, there's a lock and dams that's certainly you know used um, by both uh, uh, cargo boats and uh, um, uh, and recreational boats. So I guess it probably has to be. I actually happen to know that the northern half of Lake Calumet itself actually isn't capable of receiving ships right now. Um, it hasn't been uh, dredge maintained by the Army Corps in a very long time. So it, uh, it currently is, it's physically not capable to hold large cargo ships. Um, it's just simply too shallow. The southern half technically is able to, but I have no idea of what degree of traffic it gets in the current day. Um, are there any boardwalks at Brig Marsh? Steven, that's, that's all you. Uh, nope, not yet. There's um, one of the projects that um, Dr. Uh, Lauren Umick is, is leading in the next, over the course of the next two years. There'll be a boardwalk that links the north side to the south side. And there'll be a little connection between, um, on that map that we we're looking at earlier, uh, between the end of Mars and Three Fingers Pond. It would be great to get some boardwalks out there, but nothing, no, nothing in the near future except for that smaller one that links the two sides. Any other questions in the chat? We did get a question about bats, and I think Stephen, you might be able to answer this too. But I know definitely for sure you do get we do get bats there. Yeah, I've seen, um, I not actually I haven't seen any this year, but I haven't been there as late as I was there last year. But last year um, at, at dusk, there were oftentimes quite a few bats flying around. Um, well, well, yeah. Walter, we had one yesterday, didn't we? Oh. Actually, Carl, after rethinking that, I'm pretty sure I misidentified a chimney swift as a bat. So. <laughs> Uh, but I, but on the other hand, I'm I'm sure that they do inhabit that area. But I no, I don't think I saw it. Womp womp. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and close things out here. So thank you all so much for joining us here tonight. This is really fantastic. Uh, I, I mean, I learned a lot about Big Marsh a lot here and I hope everybody else did here too. Thank you so much to our speakers here who took the time to share their knowledge and expertise. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, if you would like to, uh, you know, obviously go to Big Marsh, we highly encourage it. And actually, we do have an event coming up. We are going to be doing a big sit uh, on October 17th. That's a Saturday, uh, an all pretty much an all morning and day affair. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for more details about the, that event on the Chicago Ornithological Society website and the Chicago Park District website very soon, as soon as we hammer out all, those, all the last details. So mark your calendars, October 17th. You can join several of us uh, out there and all of our experts um, on what makes Big Marsh awesome. Uh, and without further ado, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a great rest of your weekend here and great week. Thank, thank you. you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.